Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to World Unity Week. This could be the most amazing, insightful, uplifting, positive programs of the entire eight days. We're blessed today to have Catherine Alexander with us. We've distilled her eight-page bio down to just a few sentences right into the heart of it. She's the founder of Bridge to Partnership, a coaching firm that helps people live in covenant with the earth. Sign me up. She's coaches for living regeneratively, bringing forth clients and the earth to life. I definitely know some people who could use that, starting with me. Her coming home project is a community for individuals that are who are active in living their covenant. The podcast that she offers, Awakening to Gaia's Voice, is available on Spotify, Apple, Google, and elsewhere. Her 20 years of research has shown Catherine the values and patterns that Gaia lives by. So using those same values and patterns means we can become true partners with Gaia in creating the next phase of our growth and development. For the first time, we know how to walk with her, bringing our gifts and true service. Like I said, this could be the one. Aren't you glad you're here or that it's being recorded so you were able to be Catherine, bring it on. Thank you so much, Charles. So let me share my screen. And we're going to talk about nature's ethics. I don't think we think about nature as having ethics. Uh, I think that's sort of a new concept for some of us. And so I thought I would start with a little, some few thoughts about what ethics, some people think ethics are. So ethics is a discipline dealing with what is good and bad with moral duty and obligation. So we've got good and bad and moral duty. Ethics tends to suggest aspects of universal fairness. So we've added universal fairness to good and bad and moral duty. And then morals often describe one's particular values concerning what is right and wrong. So we can have days of discussion around these things. And, and people have spent their whole careers trying to parse this stuff. But I thought it was also interesting to look at the fact that we have different kinds of ethics. So we have situational ethics, a system of ethics by which acts are judged instead of categorical principles. I'm not even sure what that means, actually. And interim ethics, I thought this was interesting. An interpretation of the ethical teachings of Jesus as principles enunciated for governing the conduct of the disciples during the anticipated brief span of time before the coming of the second advent and the passing of the terrestrial world. What this tells me is that we really want to be good people. And we're always trying to figure out what that means. And then there's bioethics, a discipline dealing with the ethical implications of biological research and applications. And it also sounds to me like we feel that everything is special and has a unique set that fits just it. But there isn't anything that seems to connect all of these. There's no flow that I can detect. There is no cohesion about how people should be. And I think that's been part of the problem. It's certainly been one of the issues for ethics for me for my entire life. I don't, we want, we all want to be good people. We don't want to be bad people. But why do good people sometimes do bad things, even with the best of intents? And how come we can't figure out what the common thread of goodness is? We, why is that? Does that seem to be missing in all of this? And that's where the work I've done comes in. So I'm going to start with understanding living systems, because that's something that's sort of been missing, actually, when we think about what we're doing, is that we don't really have any place for living. It's There's no life involved in most of the ethics that we talk about. We have sort of forgotten biology. But systems thinking, thinking about systems 
also offers some really unique insights. And I got to this place from Jane Jacobs. She was the first and so far the only other person that I've ever heard talk about values as systems. And why does that matter? So when we look at systems, we're understanding holes, not pieces and parts. And that kind of may seem a bit confusing at first, um, but it's like really understanding your body as a whole. And when your big toe gets hurt, your whole body reacts to it. It's understanding that connection, that your big toe is not separate, even though it may be the only thing that hurts, your whole body is in response. So we're talking about holes and understanding that we have pieces, but not seeing the pieces as the important part. They are a part of the whole. So living systems are holes composed of parts. And the parts affect the whole. When your big toe hurts, your whole body reacts. But we can't take your big toe off and put another big toe on. That doesn't work. We have a hard time changing organs from one body to another because it really, they don't fit. Everything is so unique in living systems. But both parts and holes can self-create. So the toe heals and your body heals. But the key is, and this is, I think, the missing link to ethics, is that all agree to keep life flourishing. And that's what I mean about missing biology, because the biology gives us that link. Everything on this planet is alive. And the life that's there wants to live. And it loves being alive. That, for me, is the bottom line for ethics. If we started from that place, our whole world frame could be quite a bit different. So Earth is filled with living systems. Earth is life-centric. So the purpose of that system, of that living system, and all living systems have purpose. The purpose is what I call the, the prime directive. And I'm using that because it, it has sort of this otherworldly aspect to it. And it's truly a directive. It truly is what Earth is asking from us. And it's very simple that all actions create the conditions that support life. So nature's ethic is the prime directive. All actions create the conditions that support life. There's nothing that doesn't do that because we all agree to keep life flourishing. So when we think of our body, our body is a biome. It's composed of 30,000 different critters, species, that are doing their own thing to keep their life alive. And in so doing, they keep ours alive. We can't live without them. But we're not telling them what to do. And in fact, when we try and do that, we mess things up majorly. But they are supporting our life because they agree to keep life flourishing. That's what we want too. So we're in agreement on that. And we need to be able to feel that alignment, to experience that alignment. And when we can, amazing things happen. We feel so separate. We feel so at odds, alone, drifting, unsure, afraid because we're alone and we have to figure it all out for ourselves. And that's all an illusion. It's an illusion because we have not seated ourselves in life. We've not accepted that part. We don't trust that part. We think it's all about us. So we trust ourselves, sort of. But we are young. <laughs> the biome is old. Our bodies are old. The experience there has been there for millions of years. There's a wisdom there that we can tap into because it is right here but we have to go inside to do it. We have to be in concert, in cohesion, in alignment with that. 
And if our desire gets married with our body's desire, if we all agree to keep life flourishing, things become much more simple. They're not near as complicated as they seem. So where did all these values come from? I told you that I did 20 years of research, and I did. And I looked at science. I looked at indigenous wisdom. I looked at poets. I looked at psychology. So I want to share the values and patterns that the earth uses and how everybody sees the same things slightly differently yes because it's a different perspective but there are so many overlaps autopoiesis for those who don't understand what that term is means self-making and that is a magical space that is truly magical space and i would refer you to my podcast where i go into that more deeply but the ability of all individual living things to make their own life is so key it's responsible for the constant change everything changes we know that this is why because everything is learning everything is making new choices everything is doing new experiments to see how it can enrich its own life and then everything else has to adjust to that the coherence is that everybody is seeking life is to making to make life better and that coherence allows for that flexibility and that change to change and yet stay the same. And that's a magical space. And that's what Centropy is talking about. So we need, the, the diversity is so inherent, it's mind-boggling, actually. I, you can do a meditation on diversity and just explode in euphoria when you begin to see the amazing difference that's here and still coherent. I mean, that's awesome. That is so awesome. And if every other living thing can do it, I don't see why humans can't. Indigenous wisdom talks about right relationship. Of course, we're all kin, right? They really reference the fact that we have this relationship. And when you love, when there is an energy in your heart, you just want to give. That's a natural expression of that life. And that's what reciprocity is. It's the spontaneous giving and receiving of appreciation and gratitude for the gifts that are present all around us by every living thing. The indigenous are the only group, however, that really talk about the future first. They're the only ones. They brought us that. The, uh, my mind is not getting the word, but the precautionary principle that you shouldn't do in science anything that would cause harm to the future. That's a really great thing to include in these patterns because that's what nature does. But, but there's a but here, because nature does these kinds of experiments, she's constantly experimenting. And then if it doesn't work, she tries again. So that is a way of integrating death in life, which is something that I, I find the other ethical stances that we have are so poor at. We don't understand why death is part of life. We don't understand the ethics of killing. Everything eats something else. So there is an ethic in killing. But nothing but humans kill for pleasure, kill for sport, kill for status. These are not ethical ways of killing. Killing for power over, because if you're in power over, you're not in right relationship. So I feel that nature gives us an ethic for understanding so much of what we really haven't understood well up till then. Systems thinking, what systems thinking really did for me that was new is dynamic stability. So dynamic stability talks about the range of change. I mentioned that everything changes and everything does change. You change every day. You've got new ideas, new ways of being, a new mood, a new attitude, a new level of energy. So you do things differently, but there's a range in which you function. If you get way out of that range, on either side, there's problems. 
And we know that. But we tend to want to make boundaries that are walls. Nature doesn't do that. All boundaries are permeable. Things flow back and forth. That's not to say that they're not there, but they allow for a range of movement. And that range is what gives us the stability and the dynamic capacity at the same time. So there are things to be learned from each of these places. Poets and psychology talk about agency. We as humans are very concerned about agency. We really think that we should do stuff. But we do stuff to do it to other things and to each other <laughs> and even to ourselves. We don't work with that. And that's a different kind of agency. The ability to be interdependent and co-creative in a way that you work with everything. That creates a different kind of ethic because you need to be responsive and not blind to what your impact is. We're pretty much blind. We do stuff and then watch to see what happens. We don't take into account that relationship. We don't take to, into account that interdependence or the co-creative piece of this because everything has to respond to what we do. And not all of those responses are things we want. One of the things that poets and psychology have brought forward is that humans are intrinsic to life. I know it's really tempting when you are in such pain at the loss of the beauty that we're facing, when you watch things that you treasure die and disappear, when you see the horrors that we're inflicting on each other, it's really easy to become cynical and to say the earth is better without us. But that's not actually true. And that's not true because we came from earth. We weren't dropped on this planet in whole cloth. We evolved through other humanity, other living things. And our evolving is an attestment, a testament to the fact that we were needed, that there was some gift we give that no other species offers. And that's true of every species. That's why they're there. Every species has something unique that it offers to the whole of life. And we are no exception to that. But we have not ever looked at that, paid attention to that. So we need to replant ourselves and re-listen to what Earth is telling us because we have gifts that will make a huge difference. And for me, this is really the key. So why ethics of all things in a time of crisis? I mean, shouldn't we protect, be protecting ourselves or being out and go out there with, with hammers and chisels or doing, be, be doing something dramatic? I think ethics, especially when we listen to the ethics of nature, gives us a clarity and a vision for what we need going forward. We need life, right? That's what we want. And that's what Earth gives us. She gives us that drive to life. That's what she wants. So if we work with that, if we partner with that, we have a direction, we have a clarity, we have a vision, and a great comfort to know that what we do is in harmony with life. When you feel that, there is an emotional resonance that you don't get in any other way. It gives such a peace of mind to know that you are doing what you, what you can do and need to do to keep life going. I don't think there's a greater gift. What we're doing now is really the definition of insanity, right? We're doing the same thing and expecting different results. So if we're not doing the same thing, we have to do something different. And the question would be, what is that? And the very simple difference is to listen to nature, to listen to the planet, to listen to Gaia to mimic her, follow her lead, do what she does, act in the same way she acts. And then we will begin to see what we contribute because we are unique. We are going to do that in a different way than any other living system does. And that's the gift. And we will discover that as we go along. So here's the active part. There are three value systems that we innately use. 
when I get into values, people always go, well, whose values are you talking about? So we're going to talk about your values, and this is the proof of that. So if you have a pencil and paper, would you please get it? Please take a few minutes to do that. I want you to write these down because it's your memory. If we were in person, I would be passing out something so that you would have something to take away with this. I think it's useful for you to use in the future when you reflect on who you are and what you care about. So I'm going to give you a little quiz. There are 15 values, and I would guess that all of them will have some resonance with you. I've never experienced anybody who says, I don't care about this. And I'm going to ask you to rate them from one to five. So five is the most important to you. And you may have as many fives as you want. One means I don't really care about that as much as the others. And you can have as many ones as you'd like. Okay, so are we ready? So we're going to go a little slow because I want you to write down the words and then I want you to put the number after the word so that you know what you wanted. So these are the values. So the first is strength. So how important is strength to you on a scale of one to five? Loyalty. How important is loyalty to you on a scale of one to five? Honor. How important is that on a scale of one to five? Standards of belonging. Now, people stumble over this. So what this means is that there's criteria. There are standards for how people become part of the in-group. How important is that to you? Tradition. A scale of one to five. Honesty. On a scale of one to five. Inventiveness. On a scale of one to five. Thrift. On a scale of one to five. Optimism on a scale of one to five. Productiveness, one to five. Diversity, one to five. Empowerment, one to five. Co-creation. One to five. Interdependence. One to five. And concern for the future. One to five. Okay, now I want you to look at that and see where your fives are. If you had fives in the first five, so that's from strength to tradition, this is the protective values and loyalty is the key value there. And it's just what it says. It is about protection. It's very much about us and them. And I'm not going to go into all the other values that fit in this particular system. And it is a system. But I think you'll see where I'm going when I do the next one. So the next five from honesty to productiveness is the effective value system. This is about trading mostly. Business should come in here. And I'm willing to bet that we have people in the audience who have fives for loyalty and fives for honesty. And I'll bet that you've also experienced in your own personal life the tension between these two. It is often seen that people who are honest are not team players. They are subverting the loyalty to whatever person or ideology you're supposed to be loyal to. That is a real tension 
because the purposes, the intents of the system are different. This is about being effective. It's not being about being safe. Being safe requires certain things, and loyalty helps with that. Discussions about honesty don't. In business, in trade, when you're working with other people, honesty is really a good thing. It's really helpful. But you're trying to be effective in that process, not necessarily safe. And if you are effective, there is a kind of safety that comes from that, right? When there's trust, there's safety. So safety has morphed into a different kind of thing in this system. And in the last system, from diversity through concern for the future, these are nature's values. So this is about life. So safety looks different here than it does in the other two systems. There is nothing wrong with either one, with any of these. They've all been useful for a very long time. Where we get into trouble is when we conflate them. You can't have loyalty and honesty in the same system. It does not work. And you know that. You've had that experience, I'm sure. It just doesn't work because they have different intents. You're corrupting both systems by doing that. So neither one works well. And we have that, that situation in business all the time where we fight this invisible battle and we don't understand what it is we're fighting. But again, I come around to a shared vision. I mean, we've done that in business for a very long time and it's been very useful, but we have not really gone deep enough. If it's just really about life thriving, if it's about creating the conditions that support life, that shared vision requires us to do very different things than we've ever done in any of these other systems before. And it opens up a whole new world of possibilities. Possibilities that actually are exciting because we can feel it in our body. We feel the joy and excitement of that when we do it. We do not necessarily feel that in the other systems. Our egos can get in inflated, yes, and we can feel good about things and we can be happy for stuff. But that resonant joy, that bliss that your whole body feels when it says yes, only comes when we do things that support life because then everything in us knows we're going in the right direction. So we have this innate barometer about how to be ethical. We know, and we know, we know, we know that. We all know that. And we diss ourselves because of all this other stuff. Our minds get in the way. Our, our understanding of the poverty of relationships that we mostly manage get in the way. We don't take the risk to make those relationships real. We keep them in the illusional thing. We all feel like we're going to make a profit. So yay, we're all happy. But we're not. And we know we're not. But we never have that conversation. So ethics are inherent in life. And we are life. We understand this ethic. We know it. So now you have a sense of which systems you relate to best. And you can see how values have evolved over time. And in this time, we're being called to, be, to do a very different thing. So don't beat yourself up. There's no right or wrong. There's no better. There is understanding and being able to manage and to begin to see and discern when you're caught in old habits and old beliefs. That's really what this is about. We're moving into a whole new thing. And those old things come with us, you know, we don't just drop them. So we need to learn how to manage those things. To live regeneratively requires a new purpose and new values. So really hanging on to the fact that we want life. We want to live. We want to thrive. We want the joy of being here. That's really important. And to do that, we're going to have to release old habits and old beliefs. We're going to have to let that fear 
that sense of insecurity, that sense of being separate go and really hang on to the fact that we are, we are connected. We can't help but be connected. We are life. We are a collection of life. We're a biome of our own and everything in us wants life. So trust that and trust that with curiosity and with the willingness to experiment, to try things. We always do that. It's no big thing to not have it work the first time. You just pick yourself up, dust yourself off and try, start all over again. It's actually about joy because that joy and bliss of being in love with life is our path forward. If we follow that, if we pay attention to that, we will find that we are ethical. We are treating life as life needs and wants to be treated. The patterns and the values are so useful because they give us insight to some of the dynamics that we need to, to manage and to, to work with that we're not familiar with. And so it opens up our minds in a different way to how to be with this world. So now I am, thank you for your participation and I'm open to questions. Uh, Catherine, what were the uh, three clusters? Uh, nature's values, what were the other two? Safety? So, yeah, so safety, I call them the protective value set. There's protective. 15, yeah, there's 15 values in each set. And five, they, in, five in each set, yeah. So well, protect. no, there's 15. I didn't show all of them. Oh, that, I see. Okay. That there's, made there's it too long. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. protective, and what was the second cluster? Effective. Effective. Okay, yes. thanks. Yeah. So they're each purposes for that system. Um, and we've used them to with a, a fair amount of success. But for this particular time, it doesn't really work. We're in a place where we the damage we've done to life is so profound that until we get back on board with what the prime directive is, that all actions create the conditions that support life, we are just at a loss of what to do. We're starting to do parts and pieces again, and we need to do holes. And the only hole that we can really start with and trust is life. I mean, it's pretty simple. It's not rocket science. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm wondering, you know, with the theme of New Earth rising and all that entails, and to me, it's the transformation of human consciousness that's the opportunity. Is that's there right. a fourth system? I mean, you've got to joy and bliss. I looked back at these, and before you said there were 15 in each system, I was more sure that if I had to pick a group of these that I resonate with most, it's the nature, four of the five in nature's system are mine. You know, I love those yeah. of empowerment and co-creation. And yeah, that. yeah, yeah. But but is there a fourth system, and is that something that you create and design and share with the world? I don't think there is a fourth system. I and I don't think I think we need to pay attention to the planet. It's not about anybody's system. It, and it's about the planet. The planet needs our help. The planet is life. Life is calling to us to, to be a partner, to walk with it. And I think that's the system we need to pay attention to now. It gives us so much, actually. When you look at those patterns, there is so much there to really begin to understand how the world works and how to work with the world. Um, that it it's it gives us I think everything we need at this point in time. Yes, well, it's, it, it's kind of cosmic that uh, I manage about a hundred different social media accounts, and the one that's the largest with about forty eight thousand followers, which is small but still our largest, is here's somebody coming in. It's Jay. Is the Gaia Soul Alliance. And it's mostly international, and I would love to share this there, as well as connect you more with what we're doing with the Borrego Institute for Living Design with Tamsin. Sure. You know, I filed her articles with Incorporation Remove, and a, a lot of what you said sounds like a Tamsin presentation from an evolutionary biologist perspective, right? Yeah. I mean, 
piece is just around uh, frequently Kurt Johnson, when he's speaking about dynamics and in individuals and organizations, he talks about we really need more focused on the good of the whole, the good of the whole, the good of the whole, than if we have that pattern. And the good of the whole has to include Mother Earth, right? So right. It's and us. Listen, to me, the word is steward airship. And our little room is about loving, living Earth, steward airship, which is service, stewardship sustainability and spiritual principles and practices. And I'm looking at all of that right here, right? So I feel <laughs> honored to have you with us with your presentation in our little room. So thank you, Kat. And oh, there was probably a note in the chat from someone who had to leave early. If you haven't seen that, please read that. She she realized she had to go somewhere, but she was very complimentary of what you were what you were already beginning to share. Is there anyone else who would like to raise a comment or question? Uh, Jay, I just see you joined us and I've seen you in a number of the World Unity Week rooms. Yeah, and Leo was very nice and sort of capsulating the, the values, um, some of the principles that were talked about. So if you came in late, Jay, you could kind of read that over and get a sense very quickly of some of the things we talked about. Catherine, when, when you mentioned uh, future first, I thought of process theology, Charles. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, yes, uh, you know, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, versus, you know, ethic systems that look to the past or look to a past teacher. Uh, many ethic systems are set up that way, but to think of the future as the as the as the organizing principle <laughs> is a, yeah. is is a really valuable point of view, I think. And oh, I love okay. the the body metaphor, uh, you know. But how does the toe know what the ear needs? You know, our <laughs> brain our brain uh, synthesizes all of that in the in the body organ. But in the social body organ, how do we know what Catherine's thinking and what Charles is thinking and how their insights uh, make a difference? How do we get a collective mix of wisdom? And I just came from HR's topic today was uh, yes. AI. And AI, I think, can help us see other perspectives. You know, it can do the group wisdom by collecting all these perspectives and putting them on the table. Whereas individually, we have our biases. You know, we we process, but we have our biases, our our point of view. And AI, I think, can liberate us from that uh, isolation, and that we get to stand back and see the problem uh, from many perspectives at the same time. And uh, I think that's how nature works. <laughs> you know, nature, we think of uh, ecologies rather than uh, individual species. And so really, I think you're proposing an ecological model of ethics, uh, yes, Catherine. It's a planetary consciousness. Oh, hallelujah. You know, I was thinking about, you know, every individual had that epiphany from outer space. You know, this is our home. There's only one. And the theme today is whatness, how convenient that is. Perhaps we would have an RI, an <laughs> AI. And, yeah. the, and the RI could be regenerative or regenerative, but what came to mind for me was responsibility responsibility intelligence, responsibility is my personal responsibility to help ensure the good of the whole and the whole thing that we are blessed and privileged to dwell upon. And respectful. You can add respectful to that. There you go. Yeah. Let's just keep on going. So, Jay? Doctor? I would, yeah, I would say the reverence is my R on that. Very good. Very good. Sort of yes. owning owning the reverence for all yes. and uh you know in the oneness um i apologize for not being fully engaged in the conversation i had intended to come in and you know listen and uh make my lunch while <laughs> while listening but i also love getting to connect I, one thing i really love about world unity week is getting to connect with people like in these spaces where it's just a few people it's not you know you know, people in the room and, you know, there's no, there's no way to actually, you know, connect with people. So well, I, 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 would, I would love to listen for a few more minutes while I, you know, grab a quick bite and then I will be back.
Your timing is perfect. Your contribution is most gracefully received. Thank you. And Jacob, uh, Leo, the um, Jane Jacobs' book is Systems of Survival. It's a very small book. Yeah, uh, I put I put a Wikipedia article to that uh, topic, Systems of Survival. Yeah, yeah, she's she's quite an amazing. Um, I talked with her just before she died, and I do feel that that is the most important book that she wrote, frankly, um, because of the systems aspect to values. We've never understood that. And when you do, it just makes so clear some of the issues that we get into. You can see how, I mean, we just, because they're intangible and you can't touch them, and because we have emotional connections to our values, we see them all the same. We see them all as a big pot that we can pull from. And that's not true if they're systems. Then you get into other issues. The corruption of one system over another when you mix those values that don't have the same intent. So understanding that is really helpful, I think. Um, and you can see us going down the path. I mean, you can just see when you want, to, when loyalty comes in, when, I mean, Exxon is my favorite example of this. When that ship made a mess of Alaska coastline, the people from Exxon came and were just horrified at what had happened. They wanted to make them whole. They told the, the cities, the towns there, we'll make you whole. We'll do this. We'll repair this. Oh, my God, how horrible it is. Then they go back to Exxon and they go, oh, crap, we have to pay for it, right? And their loyalty to the company trumped the loyalty to these other people who were very far away and they didn't really know. And they spent 20 years fighting that statement and then gave them a pittance. So, I mean, it makes a really big difference what value set you choose. If they'd even picked effectiveness and wanted to be honest and wanted to work with that and were able to be co-creative, I mean, it would have been a totally different thing, which is where business should play, but it doesn't often enough. And that's part of the problem we're seeing now, where we have people who are trumping profit over the life of the planet. I saw this morning on um, LinkedIn, which I will put on my website, uh, bridge to partnership.com, an incredible video that NASA put together that shows carbon dioxide in the planet for the year 2021. It is awesome. It is awesome. I it's it's so overwhelming to watch that cloud come and just choke the earth. It is just. And we're doing that instead of loving life. And it's the profit, the loyalty to our company, the fear of what are all these people who are going to be put out of work going to do? Well, there is other work to do. <laughs> but there's no coherent plan. So yeah, we're all left to our own devices and that's scary as hell. So if the whole world of 99 days of Easter unity were tuned in to your wisdom, your guidance, your advice, your coaching, given a thousand and one things that come to me every day, every minute, it seems like, where is our focus needed most? How can our, our heart do the things that bring you joy and shove everything else well you're back so, to in bliss the first two on the fourth system i mean it has to we know when we resonate with life our body knows it so we we have the path is right there um yeah it's going to require us doing hard things absolutely um, I tell people to put their hands in the dirt. If you haven't done that, your body needs the dirt. The biome in your body needs the dirt because it's connected to the, to the bacteria in the earth. That bacteria feeds you. There's scientific proof of this. Your mood in cha changes. Your health increases. You need the dirt. <laughs> so put your hands in the dirt. That's the first thing. And then trust your heart. I mean, we don't, we don't, we're not connected to ourselves. We've, we've been so socialized to be outside of ourselves that it's real work to go back inside and to pay attention. 
So that's what we need to do. I mean, these are not glorified things. It doesn't make us feel warrior-like in a lot of ways. And I've really chosen not to use the warrior term because I don't think that's served us. I think it really hooks us into old stuff. I much prefer guardian or even curator that we become partners with the earth. We work with it. I We have this unique ability, as far as we know, to be reflective on what we learn. If we reflected on how we can support and enhance and stimulate the life on the planet, what a different framework that would be. And how interesting it would be to see what we contribute to that. I think that is actually quite euphoric. I mean, I'm truly talking about planetary consciousness because if we become connected and in sync with the, the desire for life that everything has, and we bring to bear our gifts on that, I'm not sure what would happen. I think it would be a whole new experiment but one that would just thrill everything. I think that's the gift we give. That's why we're important. Well, I'm looking forward to Harry Uvigi's introduction to Brand Earth that I've been privileged to be uh, fly on the wall for the last few weeks and months and spend some time with John and Summer Joy Raymer Raymer and Tamsin and Harry in Borrego Springs. And one of the images that may show up this week in World Unity Week is Harry as the Green Guardian. Uh, your, your word guardian really captured that essence of caring for Gaia. You know, it's Gaia Guardian. So yeah. I, I really uh, deeply moved by not just what you've shared, but what you haven't shared. It's like you held back 10 of each of the 15 uh, the system. So, you you know, now we've got to come back for the rest of the training, right? <laughs> Which, yeah, by the be... way, I am offering a course in August um, to go more deeply into the values. So that's available. It's on my website if people are interested. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that we got around to that because, again, when I share this with the 48, the, the most responsive uh, platform, uh, Gaia Soul Alliance, I mean, Sometimes a thousand people and interact a day and what? You know, where do they come from? So that course information will be very useful to include. Uh, I cut off somebody, was that Leo or Jay? Yeah, I was gonna say I put some comments in the chat. I think choosing values is a matter of choosing who we hang out with. That would be a real relational ethics. Uh, when yeah. I was teaching values clarification years ago. I realized I was reifying values. Values don't exist all by themselves. They only exist in a group, a life context, a group context. We get our values from the, the people we hang out with. Uh, they're, they, they, they don't just float around and we can grab them at will. And so I think the uh, being connected to ourselves, I would rather put the emphasis on connecting with others in our society rather than connecting our heart and our head, you know, because then we're stuck in that individual uh, shell. And uh, so just some, some comments. We trust ourselves, but ourself <laughs> is not in alignment with the larger context of life. We don't consider the common good. We don't consider the dispossessed. Uh, we have our self-interest, our point of view, our biases. And so it's a matter of how do we connect more with each other uh, so uh, a relational ethics can evolve. Well, if we are really clear that our actions create the conditions that support life, I think that really informs how we act with each other. Because some of our actions don't support the life of other people. They really undermine what other people are able to do. We withhold, we distort, we do all sorts of things to others. And so I think that that, again, would would help correct would help us balance that because we're trying to create the conditions that support all life other people as well as other living systems yeah 
John Perkins, John Perkins has been meeting with a few people every other week working for what may actually become a new synergy circle around the life economy. And he, he said something, I don't remember exactly how I got into it, but it's like, there are all these good causes, all these worthwhile causes, but we're at a point in time where we need some focused energy. And maybe the question to ask is, is my present activity, suite of activities that I'm occasionally overwhelmed with, part of the solution or not? You know, yeah. maybe it's time for us to step back and reassess when, where, how, and with whom may I best contribute to the awakening, to the new after rising, to yes. the worship of Mother Earth. I'm, I'm ready to. I'm ready to take that pause. So, Dr. Tim. Tom, Dr. Tom, you've been quiet. And I guess he's going to remain so. <laughs> and Suzanne, we haven't heard from you either. multitasking. Well, I had thought that I should have been, but I'm so grateful that I wasn't. You know what I'm saying? I'm thanking you for your significant substance. Uh, Catherine, you've been doing this values work for decades, and it yes. would be fascinating to read your autobiography, how you've moved from one insight to another. You mentioned systems thinking was an influence for you, but I'm sure there were other uh, chapters along the way. And uh, so maybe we need to take your course to get the full panoply of, of <laughs> all 45 values and how they interrelate and how you moved, how, you know, what your own evolution was as an ethical thinker. Yeah, the systems thinking has been just huge. I started out with, um, well, actually, in my master's degree, I read the entire work of um, oh, and I can't pronounce his name, Benafoli or whatever it is, who first posited systems thinking. And I remember at the end of the book thinking, my gosh, he thinks it applies to everything. <laughs> <laughs> and that, and then I got involved with Fritjof Capra. Um, I lived in Berkeley, or I lived in Oakland, and he lived in Berkeley. And so he would give public lectures in preparation for writing his books. So I have reams of tapes that I have that I took and I would listen to them while I walked the dog in the hills. Um, so that has been really seminal in my thinking and particularly his viewpoint. And I valued his viewpoint so much because of the spiritual component that he infuses in everything he does. He spent years with brother David Stendelrast and they would talk and have just huge discussions. They did that for years and years. Um, so there was always this seeding of what could be very abstract. Um, and I, oh, what was his name? Cybernetics was part of my PhD work and I never could relate to it. It just didn't make any sense at all because it wasn't connected to biology. I just didn't feel that connection in that. I mean, the concepts are useful, I guess, but the, the lack of connection just made it so dry and sterile for me. I could not spend any time there um, it really needs to be connected to life because that's who we are that's what that's the whole point you know that's what we want to have happen in our life is life we want to enjoy it we want to be here in, in you know in the thrill and the excitement and the wonder of being alive that's why we love nature i mean when you we Nate, I have come to think of beauty as really integrity in action. That what we see as beautiful has integrity. It's the integrity that we're really, that is the expression of beauty. Beauty is the expression of integrity. That it's one of the ways we know that integrity is there. Uh, and certainly in the living world, there's nothing that's not beautiful. I mean, grotesque, weird, strange, yes, but beautiful at the same time. Yeah. Well, Jay has asked a question. I know that we need to leave for a radio interview or some type of interview, but he's saying synetics or uh, did I hear you say cybernetics? What was the reference? Oh, centrin, centr centrin centrin yeah. Um, 
and it's kind of the meshing of things, how they um, come to agreement about stuff. Uh, we've gone from, historically, we've gone from single cell to double cell to multi-celled. How does that happen? I mean, think about that for a minute. Every cell is out for its own self, okay? It wants to make its own life the best it can. And yet it has agreed to merge, to, to partner with, to stay with, to couple with another life form for some reason. So there's a benefit there, a mutual benefit. So how does that happen? How does that happen here? With our trillions and billions, quadrillions of cells, all of different entities coming into harmony. How do they do that? What is their frame of reference, would you think? Do you think it's something we could do too? <laughs> Are we as smart as the rest of the cells on our body, do you think? You know? No, I don't know. <laughs> But I think we're going to find out. I think I think somewhere is a magic glue. Yeah. Does well, it boil down to just saying yes? Yeah, with love. Yeah. 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 And being responsive. When somebody says, ouch, instead of going, bam, I don't want to hear that, or push it away because I don't want to hear that, go, oh, sorry. How can I not ouch you? What can we do to, about that so that the ouch isn't there? Yeah. One thing I, I uh, sort of reluctantly took part in um, a class that was on um, um, yeah. a comedy, like a free flow comedy. If I forget the name off the top of my head. Um, anyway, where you are, it'll come back to me in a second. Um, but you're there, you know, with your troop or whatever, and everything is about. Um, saying yes, it's it's yes and. Right. If you ever question anything, anything that anybody throws at you, it's improv. Uh, what's that? Yeah, it's improv. Yeah, thank you for the word. Yes. Uh, yeah. So yeah, that's it. You say yes and, and then you move. You create the next world for the next person to live into. Yes. So it's like I've really taken that as a guidance for life. Okay, well, how can we say yes? And, you know, the next the next world that we're going to, to collectively live into and not stop the show at any time by asking a question <laughs> or, or reversing the, the speed of things, right? Beautiful, yes. I think That's it's what right. John, John Raymer is constantly referring to as radical collaboration and teaming up. You know, now is the time. Uh, who said more time instead of so? Programs that we're watching and recording. Yes. But well, we'll be doing this again um, on the 22nd, Thursday, or Friday, Friday, 23rd, I guess, is Friday. Um, at 1 p.m. Pacific Time, 4 p.m. EST. So in Shannon's room, we well, are one. Send me a link to this recording and the details of that. And or let you just go back and put it on the Trello card and I'll okay. get it up there on the. On the okay. On the, okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for again, opening our eyes and our hearts. And well, thank listening. you for listening. I appreciate it. Yes. Gaia's voice, not mine. Thank you, Leo. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, everyone.